Well, good morning. morning. You all sound very good this morning. Glad to have you back. Glad to have a couple of you here that weren't here. Thank you for being here for this. And um, we're going to have a good morning this morning. I do have a couple of announcements to make. Uh, First of all, we have a bookstore out there, and I've mentioned it a couple times, and there are several things out there, but I do want to point a couple things out. Mike has a a new book that came out, when was it, about a year ago or less than a year ago? Last, okay, last fall? Some, last fall. Given to the main thing, A Lifetime of Disciple Making. I want to encourage you to pick that up. Max also has an autobiography that just came out, what, Christmas or so? Somewhere around the first of the year. The Possibilities of a Life. I do want to encourage you to pick that up as well. Uh, And there are several other things out there. I mean, Max has written these little booklets. And I was telling somebody last night, I've, I've I've not read all of them, I don't think, but I've read most of them. Max can pack more in one of these little booklets I mean, it's just like there's theology, there's practice, there's, I mean, it's, these are really, really good. And they're small, but he covers it, okay? It's, it's not light. So pick these up. I think they're $2.50 a piece. No, no, they're $5 a piece. They're $5 a piece. And we're bundling them together. You can get $5 a piece or four for 20. So just let you know that. Some of you have asked about some tracks. We do have some tracks. We don't have a lot of them. We'll be ordering more, but we do have some out on the table that's on this end of the foyer. And so pick a few of these up. Uh, they're, they're the Steps to Peace with God tracks, very similar to what Max was talking about last night. And so they're there for your, just to pick them up and use them. Just when you pick them up, use them, okay? Also this morning, I think that's it. We're going to have Mike and his wife, Deanna. Guys, come on up. They're going to be sharing with us this morning about walking through the storms of life. And uh, we're going to let them sit down up here. And uh, we will have a question and answer time at the end of our time together this morning. And so some of these questions may pop up during this kind of talk. So write them down somewhere so you can come back to them. I'm going to pray for us one more time. Father, thank you again for your love for us. Thank you for this time. It's... uh, I always look forward to times where we sit under teaching and let your truth just kind of soak in. And so, Father, those truths that we can't really uh, get our heads around yet, just let them sit there for a while. Let them soak. And I pray, Lord, that it goes with us. And we just ask again for your Holy Spirit to change our lives. Your word is eternal, Lord. And so we pray and ask that those words would rock our world. And so we love you, we thank you, ask that you would be with Mike and Dee, bless them now as they speak to us, in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Randy. Good morning. I have a problem in your church building. I keep looking out that window, thinking, oh, oh, oh. when you have big old Dumbo ears, this really doesn't feel, there we go. Are we, are we done back there, Randy? No, I didn't just <laughs> I feel like I'm in the doctor who's checking me over. He's not putting one on me. <laughs> there. Am I all right now? Yeah, we're good. Whew. I was afraid there was a problem. Um, I look out this window and I think, wouldn't it just be cool, once the building's paid for, that they had doors that opened up to a deck? And you could have concerts in the parking lot. And on a nice, cool spring day, just the breeze come in and crank the music up loud and the preaching even louder. Oh, my, my. You could get in all kinds of trouble. (laughs) Sounds like fun, doesn't it? Um, I wanted to do a a quick recap of some things that I think I missed last night. Um, Sometimes with Parkinson's, it seems like all the sentences don't connect in my head. And so I have to keep making sure I'm clear because I think I'm clear as a mud pile. And uh, so I want to make sure that you grab hold of something. So I just want to read this to make sure because I got up at 3.30 this morning and wrote this, so it's got to be good. (laughs) I mean, when I'm totally incoherent and I'm writing, it's got to be an inspiration of the Holy Spirit. 
Discipleship is the process by which a person chooses to count the cost and follow Christ by identifying, imitating, and obeying Christ. Discipleship is the process by which a person chooses to abide in Christ by remaining, obeying, doing God's word, and praying God's word, by bearing the fruit of the Spirit and the fruit of men called winning souls to Christ, by realizing I can do nothing separated from Christ. Discipleship or disciple-making is that process by which a person chooses to major in two things, two areas, keeping the great command plus one, love God supremely, love my neighbor as I love myself, and love my brother in Christ as Christ loves me. And it means doing the great commission. In Christ's power, I will make and raise up disciple-makers. In Christ, I will bear witness to the gospel and the hope within me. In Christ, I will teach and live anything that leads to life and godliness. And lastly, discipleship is the process, or disciple-making is the process by which a person chooses to allow the Holy Spirit to transform their mind and daily conform into the very image of Christ, which means the way we think is transformed radically, radically changed to that of Christ. You do realize Jesus doesn't think like we do. It is allowing pride to give way to humility and self-exaltation to turn to servitude. I allow the Holy Spirit to transform my mind and I choose to conform to the image of Christ by submitting to the Word of God and the very character of Christ becomes mine. I would just want you to understand that is disciple-making. That is the process of discipleship. So... I'll type that up and send it to him. It, that was free. Um, we want to talk about walking through the storms in life because it's going to happen. It's going to be a reality for you. If you haven't already been through some, you're going to just hold your breath. I've asked a pastor to read these passages of Scripture. Some, they're, they're found in your notes. So Dr. Reverend Keith Mathis would you stand and write, read those verses that I asked you to loudly? He's reading all the verses out of 1 Peter. All right, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6 and 7. In this you rejoice, though, now for a little while. If necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor. At the revelation of Jesus Christ. The second one. Go ahead. Okay. I thought you were loud. Do what? I thought you were loud. I've got more like you have. Oh. So, <laughs> first Peter chapter four, verses one and two. Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking, for whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. And then 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 and 13. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in so much as you share Christ's suffering that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. And then the last one in Peter is chapter 5, verses 6 through 11. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him, because he cares for you. Thank you. I appreciate that. We want to talk about the storms of life. And in your notes, there's a, a lot of different possibilities. I'm not going to get off on why storms come our way, per se. I don't want to get off in the theological dialogues that take place among pastors and staff pastors and professors about the origin of trials. I just want to say this, trials are going to come. However you interpret them, they're going to come. I do have a, th a prejudice that I believe that the closer you are to obeying Christ and the more active you are in the great commission of Christ 
and the more active you are in spreading the gospel of Christ, you're at the tip of the spear, and you're more likely to have spiritual warfare as well as physical and other type of attacks. That's just for free. But I want us to talk about this morning is that first and foremost, understand that spiritual storms come to us all. The storms, the realities of troubles, they come our way. Uh, there's a variety of reasons, and I've given those for you to consider on your own time because I really hope you'll take the time to, to really look at, at the, what the Word of God says. There's tons of scriptures written on affliction, and I think you would do yourself a great service as to studying why this happens. Sometimes bad things happen to you because we just do bonehead things. Sometimes it's because we're in spiritual warfare. Sometimes it's because we're just in a sinful fallen world. There's just a lot of reasons, and I'm going to deal with the latter primarily. We will look at the trials of faith, the storms of life that blindside us all, the valleys that bring us to the edge of the valley of the shadow of death. Have you ever had a trial in your life that you just despaired of life itself? Have you ever had a, a, a conflict, a, a trial so overwhelming you just cried out to God and seemed, it seemed dark and hopeless? Let me tell you, the reason I believe in making disciples is because we take the time to grow them in the Word of God and we teach them to walk in the Spirit of Christ's fullness and we ground them in the scriptures and in the presence of God. Their minds are renewed. They're conforming to his likeness in preparation for when the storms of life come. Some will be persecuted simply because they're following Christ. Others will face diseases such as cancer, heart attack, MS, strokes, Parkinson's in the prime of life. I, I, I feel very fortunate to have Parkinson's. And the way I have it, I feel very grateful to God. I remember when it first hit me about 15 years ago, I was sitting in my den in Denver, and my leg was doing this, and I couldn't stop it. I said, Dee, look at my leg. And she said, stop that. <laughs> and I said, I can't. I said, this is weird. So I went to three different doctors, and they all said, Mike, you have fight-flight syndrome. You have this, you have that. But I knew something else was amiss. Something was wrong. And then I was diagnosed with uh, Lyme disease, and that's the answer. But when the Lyme disease was treated, the tremors remained. I went to a neurologist, and he said, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but you have Parkinson's. I thanked him because I knew then what God had to face through me. And as far as I've been able to tell so far, God's handling it quite well. I worry about me from time to time, but God's doing a good job. <laughs> Many will experience a rebellious child, addictions in the close loved one, a family member that comes out of the closet, an unfaithful spouse, divorce, false rumors, attacks on your character. Sometimes you'll discover that the Christian army is the only army that shoots its own wounded. Somehow you'll be one of, you'll have some of Job's friends, you'll go through some hard times and they'll automatically wonder what you did when it may not have anything to do with you. Some of you already have and will perhaps go through the death of a child, a spouse, a sibling, very unexpectedly. No one will escape the trials of life. They're inevitable. We choose to live in Christ every day is what makes the difference. I want to walk and be and abide and remain in Christ so that regardless what comes my way, because I'm rooted in him, because my foundation is sure, because he is my foundation, Though they're not pleasant, though I don't enjoy them, in him I will stand. I like Ephesians 6 when Paul, speaking of the armor of God, said, Having done all to stand, stand. Having done all to stand, stand. We choose to live in Christ. Dean, won't you share a testimony? Sure. Okay. Can you, can you, 
let me to hold it. Okay. <laughs> you don't shake. I don't shake. <laughs> um, I just chose some storms of our life that we really didn't have any control over. We had made some mistakes in our life that caused, you know, trials. Well, that's on us. You know, we just sometimes made bad choices or did something silly. Like if you're speeding and you get a ticket, you know, that's on me. <laughs> or if you're in debt, you've spent your money unwisely, that's, that's on us. That's not God. Um, it's not anything other than our own silliness and our bad choices. But I've chosen some things that we just really didn't have any control over and how much God taught us through those things. And our first major storm of life was our youngest son. Uh, we were in seminary about to graduate, and Mike had accepted a position in Oklahoma as a pastor, our first pastorate. And our son was born, our second son. And we had no idea, but he was born with a bad heart. And it was obvious from the very beginning, he was all blue and had to have some procedures done and was transferred to a, a children's hospital in Kansas City. And, you know, it was just a, it caught us off guard. We weren't prepared for that. And here we are packed, ready to move and start a new life. And we get this surprise, you know, that, that was out of our control. And uh, it just really threw me for a loop because <laughs> it seemed like every morning when I was in the hospital, Mike had to go home at night to take care of our other son, the, you know, the doctor would come in with bad news. You know, your son's got a 50% chance of not surviving. And um, every morning it was just bad news after bad news. And finally, um, he was transferred and had some procedures done. And we just kind of, I was just kind of numb and was going through the motions, you know, just trying to survive. And Mike had to go on Sundays and Wednesdays down to Oklahoma because we'd accepted that position. And I had to stay behind with the, the kids. And um, it was a difficult time. It was really hard. And so um, we went through a surgery at eight months old, a major open heart surgery in Oklahoma City. And it was just doctors and hospitals for many, many years. Um, just a, an opportunity to trust God. Now what I did do, because I wasn't ex an experienced veteran at these kind of things, <laughs> I kind of resented the fact that it wasn't fair, you know. This child didn't do anything to deserve this, and we had served the Lord, and we'd always been faithful and tithers, and, you know, I, I thought, how could this happen to us? And um, I remember before surgery, remember the lady that asked if we had enough faith that God would heal our son, and Mike said, yeah, well, I have faith. And she said, well, if you don't have faith, because he hasn't been healed. And he said, well, do you believe he can be healed? And she said, oh, yes. And he said, okay, on your faith, I'm claiming his healing. <laughs> I don't think we ever saw her again. <laughs> but, you know, people will say things during those times, and they mean well, but it's painful, you know. And I even took Josh to a healing service, because I, you know, I know God could heal him, and I wanted to give him every opportunity and it just didn't happen. So I figured this was the path he had chosen for us to go down, and he was going to get us through it. And it was horrible, and it was, I wouldn't want to go through it. I wouldn't wish it on anyone. But, you know, he led, I, I remember praying the prayer before his surgery, because <clears throat> it was a major, they reconstructed his heart. It's just, it was a major surgery. And the, a, kid, a child bef the day before had the same surgery and had died. And so I remember saying, Lord, if, this, if you can use this child for your glory, you know, I, I just pray that you'll spare his life. But if it's going to be a hard life and it's nothing but hospitals and, and heartache, I, you know, I'm fine with letting him go right now. You know, I was okay with it. But he survived, and it's just been amazing to watch him grow into a man of God. Um, and I think it's because he has faced mortality his whole life. <clears throat> and he was able to play football, which they told us he never would. <laughs> but God made him strong and big, and, um, he, but he had learning disabilities, so we had to deal with that as well. And that made it school very hard. But I've, I believe God just has been using him. God got his heart as a, a junior in high school. And he has served the Lord in a full-time capacity even with his learning disabilities, you know, he's become an avid reader. 
and um, loves the word, and he is a campus minister. He was in Durango for 12 years and has been able to reach people that no one else could reach, like the, the transgender, the gay and lesbian community, the American Native community. That's a really lost world right there. And, you know, I just think it's because he is different than the rest of his peers, and it's because of all he's been through. And he has a, a view of life that is, you know, he realizes he's here for a short time, and he's got to make, it, make a, a difference in this world. So I've seen God use him. But he had another surgery. As a, am I running out of time? I am. Take it up. <clears throat> okay. Take it up. <laughs> Seven years ago, he had to have a, his aortic valve replaced and his aorta, part of his aorta, and it's caused strokes and seizures. So now he's dealing with that. And um, just be praying for him. His name is Josh. He's 42, yeah. living in Norman now. He's closer. Um, but his health is a real issue. And on, until God takes him, it's always going to be an issue. And we all just deal with it. <laughs> we trust God. But the thing I learned is not to compare my life to anybody else. Because you get into that, it causes, just, you know, it causes your, your heart to be restless and resentful. And I was comparing our lives to other people's lives. Well, they don't have sick children. <laughs> They're not serving Jesus. <laughs> and I learned not to compare myself and not to blame God. And also that God knows the present, our past, our present, and our future. And he, our future is in his hands, and our son's life is in his hands. And I cannot dwell on it and worry and fret. We deal with it as it happens, and he gives us the strength. And we're a lot tougher than we think we are with the Holy Spirit. You know, we have faced some really difficult times with God's strength, and I'm just amazed sometimes how strong he, he makes us. And I have learned to pray for others in the midst of it, you know, I was doing my quiet time the other day in Job, and Job 42.10. It was only when Job prayed for his friends that God restored, restored all of his, you know, tenfold, a hundredfold. But it was when he started praying for his friends. And I thought, you know, in the middle of storms, we need to pray for others who are going through this, a similar situation. And it, it changes your perspective and takes your focus off of your circumstance. But that's, a, that's our first one. All right, thank you. Isn't she marvelous? <laughs> we walk with and abide in Christ. Can you do anything apart from Christ according to John 15, 5? Nothing. Now, you can go to Walmart and buy gas. You can go to the grocery store and buy a loaf of bread. You don't have to be a Christian to do those things. But you cannot add a minute to your life you can't change your eternity. Only God can do that. And as we abide in him, we become the people that God purposed us to be. As we draw near to him and spend time with him, allowing our lives to be conformed to his life, we realize that we are in him. And when we face the storms, it's God in us. We build a firm foundation. In 1 Corinthians 3.10, it says, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation, and other men build upon it. Let each man take care how he builds on it, for no other foundation can be laid than what, that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. We want to be careful that the rock of our life is Christ. We must have a sense of urgency in doing this, but the thing we are is that we learn how to walk with Christ. We learn how to abide in Christ as a testimony that we don't do this thing called life without him. I don't have a quiet time because I'm legalistic. I heard Max say this a long time. I hope you can tell that the influence Max Barnett's had in my life. In fact, I'm such an advocate of his book. If you happen to buy mine, you'll have to buy his because I refer to him almost on every page. And so you need to read his life story and get his book. But you can't do life the way you were meant to do life unless you're grounded in the Word, unless the Word of Christ dwells in you richly, unless you learn how to pray effectively. You can't do life the way you were designed to do life if you're not committed to the great command to love Him with all your heart, mind, soul, and spirit, and strength. You can't do life if you don't love your neighbor as yourself and love the brethren. You can't do life. You were meant. Last night I just had you think for a second about your fingerprints. You are so special to God 
But if you don't abide in him, you are wasting your life. And when the storms of life come, you will miss what God had for you in the midst of the storm. We learn that our security is as we abide. Our foundation is built on the one who has overcome the world. So we learn we need not fear the storms that will most surely come. I've had the privilege, and Dee has had the privilege of being around some people that faced horrendous storms. And you see the calm in their face. We've been around Elizabeth Elliot. We've been around people that suffered great loss and speak of it as a gift. That is the result of them being rooted in Christ. Discipleship is learning how to be rooted in Christ. Disciple making is sharing the gospel so a person comes to faith and then rooting them in Christ. So the inevitable storms will not batter and break them and hurt them and wound them. Though they may be bruised, they will be stronger. Because the storms will come and we must make the most of the time, it's very important. If we aren't preparing during the good days, we'll not be ready during the storms. You understand that, don't you? It's not to be morbid or fatalistic. It's just to say this. Would you rather roof your house when it's hot outside or in the midst of an electrical storm? Neither. Uh, it's better to do it when it's hot, but safe. It's better to do it when you're sweating a little bit more than you want to, but you don't worry about a bolt of lightning dividing you in half. You prepare the roof for the days it rains. If you wait till it rains to worry about the roof, you waited too long. Unfortunately, so many of us who call ourselves Christians and followers of Christ because we're not rooted and built up. When the storms come, they do us great harm, and we fear them. Jesus spoke to them. He said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things I command you? Everyone who hears my word and does them, I will show you what he's like. He's like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation upon a rock. And when the flood arose, the stream broke against that house but could not shake it because it was well built. But those who hear my word and do not do them are like those who build their house on the ground with no foundation against which the flood arose and broke against the house. And immediately it fell and the ruin of that house was great. If you're not growing in the likeness of Christ, if you're not doing the great commission, doing the great command, you're in peril and don't even know it. It's like driving on some turnpike at 85 miles an hour without paying attention, your tires are bald. We must have a sense of urgency. We don't leave for tomorrow what should be done today. If I know I need to witness to a guy, it's on my heart, I better do it today. There may not be a tomorrow. If I know I need to say something to someone that God's laid on my heart, maybe it's someone I'm investing my life in, I need to have a sense of urgency to do it today and not put it off till tomorrow. What I've realized about we Christians is that we are, we are the ministers of procrastination. We have mastered the art of wait till tomorrow. It is better to finish the roof in the heat of the day than to try it in the middle of a thunderstorm. Put into practice today what you will need in the days of trial. Now, I'm going to tell you something about trials. I don't need Jesus any more in a day of trial than I do in a good day. Discipleship has taught me that as a learner and a follower, I need him every day. There's never a moment I don't need Christ. I started to say this a moment ago. I don't have quiet times because I keep record, and I do keep a record. I probably, and I say this without trying to sound braggadocious because that's not it at all. I can probably count on one hand the number of quiet times I've missed the last 35, 38 years. But I don't do them because I'm trying to earn favor with God. I've already got favor. I don't do it because I'm trying to be blessed. I'm already blessed. I do it because I'm desperate without him. I can do nothing apart from him. And Colossians 3.16 says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Teach and admonish one another in all wisdom with songs and spiritual songs and hymns with thankfulness in your hearts to God. 
Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Thirdly, the storms and trials, this is all in your notes. Storms and trials will come for whatever reason. Not presuming it's not because you were foolish. It's like the guy, are you going to say more about that? <laughs> Only if you don't, I don't know. <laughs> it's like the guy that smoked two and a half packs every day for 50 years and then went to the doctor with a cough and said, doctor, I don't know what's wrong. And he says, you got lung cancer. And you go visit him, he says, I don't know why God did this to me. You fool. God didn't do this. You sucked yourself to death. Or a guy drinks a bottle of Johnny and gets in his car and has a wreck and his wife is killed and he's maimed. Why did God let this happen? He didn't. You drank the hooch, you paid the price. You walk with the ducks, as Richard Koss says, you start quacking. We reap what we sow. Galatians 6, 7, God is not mocked for whatever a man sows, that shall he reap. The third thing, the storms come for whatever reason, but they can lead to a deeper dependence on Christ. I've been with a lot of young students at Oklahoma State, a lot of couples in our church at First Baptist of Pulpa, Oklahoma, where we attend walking with them through storms of health, storms of employment, storms of relationships, storms of brokenness. And what I know will happen if they stay the course, if they'll focus on the main thing, being a follower of Christ, being transformed and conformed to him, they will learn so much through this experience because it can lead them to it becoming more usable. The storms can also bring a purifying process that removes the clutter, the clutter and the dross of the unnecessary, which will lead to a deeper holiness. When you're going through a storm, you don't worry about your golf game. When you're going through a storm, you don't worry about missing the Cardinals play or missing the Sooners play. It doesn't matter. What matters is him. I'll never forget when Josh was born. I'll just say this very quickly, and I'm almost done for D to say something else. Um, D was just brokenhearted and sobbing. And I was raised that we didn't cry. My dad had pretty well beat that out of me. And I was with a knucklehead friend of mine named Tom Boyd, a guy I was discipling, a football player from William Jewell College. His wife, Cindy, her dad had been killed in a car wreck and she had been maimed and she understood the hurt and the loss. And when Dee would cry, Cindy would cry. When Dee would want to laugh, Cindy would laugh and just sat there. Tom just sat by me. And that's all I wanted because I'd already had guys come up and theologize. Do you think he was born because of your past? Do you think he was born like this because one of you's in sin? Do you think he was born like this because... because? Tom just sat there. And after about three hours, he said, are you hungry? You want a taco? That's all I needed was his prayer. A number of years later, his oldest daughter was in a serious car accident in San Diego. And I flew out to be with him. The chaplain came in and spouted some flowery words. And may I pray for you? And Tom looked at him and said, it just depends which God you pray to. And he said, pardon me? He said, I've been listening to you, and I don't know that you know the same God I do, so I'm really not interested in your God getting involved. The guy fell on his knees and asked Tom to forgive him, and Tom did, and they prayed together. But the storms and trials will cause us to have a deepening faith because all the dross and unnecessary stuff is just boiled away and you become more pliable and usable to the master. His power is manifested in our weakness. When we're at our weakest, we discover how truly powerful he is. If you're a learner, you understand, when I met Max, there was another speaker named Jack Taylor with Max. And he preached a sermon called The Power of Weakness. And I thought that was the dumbest thing I'd ever heard in my life. Power of weakness. And he quoted 2 Corinthians, well, Jack didn't quote. 
Max did. 12, 7 through 9, and it said, And to keep me from being too elated in the abundance of revelation, a messenger of Satan, a thorn in the flesh, was given to me to keep me from being too elated. Three times I besought the Lord that he would remove it from me, but he said, No, my grace is sufficient. For my power is made perfect in weakness. I will all the more gladly boast of my weaknesses then that the power of Christ may rest upon me. But did you hear what it says? When you're at your weakest, God's strength shines. His strength comes through our weaknesses. Discipleship is recognizing, God, I can't live this Christian life without you. I, I can't memorize verses without the Holy Spirit leading and guiding me and helping me. When I met Max, I couldn't memorize much. Anymore. When I met Dee, she had helped tutor me in college. And then I'd sleep through the final. I wouldn't even make it to class. I really was on academic and social probation. After one semester, I was not a good student. So I'm about to flunk out of school, and then I, I managed to salvage I got right with Jesus. And I graduated with a good, strong C average in a philosophy major because I didn't know what Christians went to school to study. <clears throat> Then I went to seminary, but by the time I went to seminary, I was a disciple, following Christ, making disciples, and memorized some scripture. And all of a sudden, my grade point went up almost two points. My IQ did not go up. I graduated with honors. I got into the doctoral program, graduated there with honors. I don't even know how that was possible. Someone asked me, how could that happen? I said, because I hid God's word in my heart. And God allowed me to remember things. Scripture and memory radically changed me. That was a detour. But it comes through knowing that I can't do it without Jesus. Do you realize you can't live the Christian life without Jesus? Again, we're not talking about the storms that are the result of our own decisions, choices, sin, or lack of wisdom. We're talking about the inevitable storms that will come for whatever reason. We're also saying that we discovered God's sufficient grace in the midst of them. And he really is able to free us from the grip of sin or troubles as the fires of his holiness purify us. His power really is manifested in our weakness. Honey, why don't you share a note? You know, one thing I want to say is if you know someone going through a real hard time in their life, you know, don't, don't try to spiritualize, you know, what you say to them. Just say, I am so sorry you're going through that. And if there's a, an encouraging scripture you can give them, I know a lot of times I send a scripture to someone and, you know, God, God can encourage better than we can. But if it's something we've been through, we, we might have some good counsel for them. But many times they just want someone to be there by them and to pray for them, and to encourage them. And uh, I had to, you know, I know people mean well, but sometimes we say the wrong things, <laughs> and it, it does more harm than good. So just, just tell them you're sorry they're going through it, and just pray for them, and encourage them, and if you have a good scripture to give them to encourage them, just do that. And whatever helped you through a hard time. But another time, it's always our children, it seems like, our oldest son... <clears throat> When he was in college, uh, he went off to college, and he was kind of in a bad place spiritually when he left. And uh, everything I worried about happened, <laughs> but he kind of crashed and burned. And he, we, he found himself addicted to drugs and alcohol and uh, couldn't keep a job. Couldn't, he had scholarship, baseball scholarships. He lost three scholarships to three different schools. And... Uh, it was just obvious he was in trouble. And so one morning, he'd moved back in, in with us, um, temporarily, supposedly, and I couldn't get him out of bed one morning to go to a job interview, and I knew something was wrong. And Mike had been telling me he thought it was an addiction problem, and, you know, I didn't want to believe it. And so finally, when I finally got him up, I said, Son, what's, what's going on with you? And he just started crying. And he said, Mom, I can't stop. I can't stop drinking or doing drugs. I'm, I'm addicted. And, and it just broke my heart. I just, 
I, my heart was broken because addiction ran in my family. And Mike and I never had alcohol or anything in our home. <clears throat> and so we got him some help. We sent him to rehab. He wanted help, which was a big step. If he hadn't wanted it, it wouldn't have done him good. And we took him out to California to San Clemente to a Christian rehab center, and he stayed there two months. We had to second mortgage our home. But I would have done anything for my child. And um, God did a work in his life. He never drank again after that. But spiritually, he, he just still struggled. And he had that stinking thinking for years. Um, it takes that a while to go away. But anyway, he moved in with a girl. <laughs> and she was not a Christian. And life just kind of went not in addiction, but in a, in a secular way. And anyway, there's, there's been bad things happen in his life since. He, he has two children, beautiful children, still married to the same girl. Uh, his daughter's had cancer. Uh, his wife has had a breakdown of some kind and is really struggling with a mental uh, thing. And, you know, it's just a lot to deal with. And he says, it's my fault. These are choices I made, you know, and... He said, I love my kids, and that's the blessing. And his daughter has him going to church every Sunday now, and she's a devout Christian, and she, she has really made this difference in his life. And now he takes his little boy, and they, the wife still doesn't go to church, but she, you know, we're still praying for her. But, you know, God knows the past, present, and future, and he knows what the future holds for our son and his family. But to see God working... It's just a thrill because he's using this little 15-year-old girl and she is taking her walk with Christ very seriously. She, they're, they're going to a great church. And Jeremy's even taking notes and praying. And call, he'll call and say, Mom, I really need you to pray for me right now. And I'm just going, I just can't believe this is the same, the same person. <laughs> I mean, he's 46 years old. <laughs> he's finally getting it. <laughs> so we, we just can't ever give up on our children. And one of the things I learned, some of the things I learned, is God loves, loves my children more than I do. And I have to give them over to him. And I have to just get out of the way sometimes. Uh, we can't live their life for them. And they, sometimes we have to we become the enabler. I was the perfect enabler because I wanted to help him so bad. <clears throat> and I had to learn to set boundaries with him and let him fail and let him fall. But it's hard when you have grandchildren involved. It's really hard because they suffer too. Um, I had to learn too that weren't, we weren't ba as bad a parents as we thought. <laughs> you know, you feel like I have failed <laughs> because we're not responsible for our children's choices they make as they get older. They, they are adults and he was making adult decisions. And so I had to learn, you know, that it wasn't my fault as much as it was choices he was making and we have to love our children even when they disappoint us. And we can't just write them off. We have to be there for them. Even as adults, uh, we can't give up on them because God never gives up on us. But that um, unfailing love is just something we need. Can't, we can love the sinner but hate the sin. And that's what we tried to do. And we see God doing some ma amazing things. So never give up on your children. All right. And we're sharing this not because we've had a horrible life. We have had and still have a great life. But yet we've experienced these storms that we didn't plan on. If you would have asked me when my children were little what they'd be, I'd, I'd tell you. <laughs> going to be godly, going to be righteous. Because we had quiet times with our kids every night. We had devotions every morning. We prayed over with them and about them regularly. Jeremy even said, I almost felt I was an abusive dad because I spanked him so much. He said, Dad, I just wish you would have spanked me more. After I picked myself <laughs> off the floor, what he was saying is, I needed it. I needed the rod of discipline. But a disciple maker must anticipate storms in a variety of places and in a variety of relationships. It may not be your children. God help that it's not. But it may be the health of a child. It may be finances. You don't know. 
Let's look at a synopsis of trials and storms. We'll just walk through this quickly. Storms and trials will come to everyone. If you're not rooted and built up in Christ, you will not survive. If you have not dug the foundation deep on the rock, when the storms come and the river breaks against your house, you will not survive. How many people no longer go to church because things didn't go as they anticipated and because their expectation was not met, they quit? That is a testimony of a person who is not a growing, multiplying, maturing disciple. The storms and trials reveal our true foundation. All I got to do is be around a person going through storms and just watch them for a day or two, and I can tell you what they believe. I can tell you what their convictions are. I can tell you where their hope rests. I can tell you a lot of things. We were in Africa in 85. Randy was there. Two of our guys got arrested and beaten up by the, the army. They thought we were South African spies, and they were... It was a scary time. So I called a meeting when we all got back together, and I asked the question, do we stay or do we go home? Now, I'm just honest as I can be. I wanted to go home. Inside of my head, I'm going, let's go home, let's go home. But I didn't say anything. We started with the two guys that got arrested and beat up because I was sure they'd want to go home. Eddie Zuniga was in his 40s and started crying and said, I thought I was going to get to be a martyr for Jesus and my kids are saying, I'm going, oh, shut up, Eddie. <laughs> and he didn't want to leave because it was obvious that Satan was afraid of our being there and he said more about it. And then Don Stivers, the other guy, young guy, and I just knew, yeah, Don, you got a new kid at home. You're going to want to go home now. Go home now. Yeah, go home now. now. No, he said, we haven't even done anything that we came here to do. And Satan obviously doesn't want us to do. Then we went around the room and we were all knuckleheads. We all said, let's stay. And I said, I think for, except for Jim Younger, we all wanted to go home. Really. But we couldn't because we were committed to stay. But what that showed me was the foundation of Randy's life. What it showed me was a young Christian named Jim Younger, what his rock was. Don Stivers, Eddie Zuniga, just go around the room, and these were the rocks these guys were built upon. Storms will come, but it just reveals what our life is built on. Storms are unpleasant for everyone. Um, I don't enjoy having Parkinson's, it's not fun. I had one of my staff ask me one time, do you get tired shaking? And I shake a lot. And I said, you just shake your hand, get a watch and time it for three minutes and tell me how you feel. At about a minute and a half, they quit. They said, I'm tired. Why don't you quit? And I said, I can't quit. I don't like Parkinson's, but I'm grateful my God walks every step of the way with me. When I'm shaking, I think he's shaking too. The Holy Spirit asked me, and I asked him, what you got shaking? And, and God's with me. I'm in Christ. He's my foundation. He's my life. Apart from him, I can do nothing. And sometimes I bemoan the fact that I have Parkinson's and I can't do what I used to do. And I never planned on ever stepping down, ever. But I realize I have to because of my health. And God will remind me, story. How many times do I have to show you that when you're weak, I'm at my strongest? But God, I feel left out of the game. Story? I'm not interested in your game. I'm interested in mine. And I'll use you until you're used up. If you'll quit whining and just trust me and walk with me. Storms are unpleasant for everyone. Storms and trials can strip away all that is deemed unnecessary in the dross of life that, law, life that blurs our vision. Again, when you go through a storm, it just kind of singularly clears up the screen. There's no blurring. There's no out of focus. Um, I shoot squirrels. I don't eat them, but I like to kill them. They're just fuzzy tail rats. 
if you like squirrels, get a life. Um, I shoot them. I have a pistol that I bought, and a guy with Parkinson should never have a pistol. <laughs> I have a couple of police officers that I've worked with, and they take me out to a range, and they'll say, after a while they say, Story, what are you shooting at? And I said, I was aiming at their heart. He said, son, you just blew his hips away. <laughs> Another time I thought, well, I'll raise it up, and I was aiming at his head, and his stomach was never the same. So I just decided, like Clint Eastwood in the movie Unforgiven, I'll just use a shotgun. <laughs> Storms and trials strip away everything that's unnecessary. That was for free. And the dross that blurs our vision. I can't see good anyhow. The Parkinson's affects my eyes. I, I'll go to the doctor next week, and I guarantee you two weeks afterwards that the glasses he sells me are not working. It's just the way it is. My world can be blurry all the time, but in Christ Jesus, I have clear sight, and the storms help that. When the storms pass, we may find that we need to repent of something, or we have to humble ourselves before God. We may find that the storm brought a lesson that makes me more pleasing to God. You see, if you're a disciple maker, you're always learning. You're always teachable, even when you don't feel like it that I discover that abiding in him, in him is the only thing that allows me to survive and thrive, regardless of the why of the storm. I can look ahead and see the end of the storm and realize I can come out of this thing better than I was when I went into it because of him, because I have learned to walk with him, to talk with him, to know him. As a disciple, we anticipate and prepare for the storms of life. Honey, why don't you share a short one? Okay. <laughs> um, I was going to share another one, but I feel led to share this one. <laughs> uh, this is the most recent thing I've been through. Um, my mom lived with us for the last four years. She was 96 when she moved in. Her husband had passed away, and she didn't have enough money to stay in the assisted living where she was staying. And I was either going to have to get a job to pay for it or have her come live with us. She's an only child. Her I'm, siblings are all All my dead. siblings are gone. I'm all she had. So uh, we moved her in with us, built on her room, and, and she you know, was so appreciative. But as her health declined, it got more and more stressful. And I gave up my life. You know, I, I was her sole caregiver. And... Uh, I basically just gave up my life to take care of her, and I didn't dream it was going to be four years. I thought at 96, she's, you know, she's not going to last very long. <laughs> but, uh, you know, God knew, and so, and Mike helped as much as he could, you know, but there's certain things he couldn't do. But as her health started declining, it got more and more stressful, and I felt trapped. And she was, every time we mentioned putting her in a nursing home, she would throw a temper tantrum. I mean... I didn't know she was such a drama queen, but I think her elderly age, you know, she felt threatened by that and would go for days, you know, throwing these fits. I and might add that her mother would bring it up. Yeah, she'd say, we you ought to put me. We never initiated. Her mother always brought it up. She'd say, you ought to put me in a nursing home. i go, well, I'll start looking. <laughs> no, she <didn't. laughs> Because it was just too much, you know, for one person. <clears throat> so anyway, long story short, um, we... We just kept her at our home because she, you know, I, I, I said, I can't take her to a nursing home with her kicking and screaming like this, you know. The emo and it was the emotional stress on me. And so I just every day would say, Lord, just give me the strength to do this because I'm weary and I'm spent and my emotions are just, I'm just dead inside. <clears throat> and every day he gave me just enough strength to get through the day. And I loved my mom, but we were never that close, you know. It was just a, a difficult situation. But anyway, and I, I, still, I still love that woman, but she passed away in January. Um, Mike and I got COVID in January, and we were both, I was the sickest, and I was still having to take care of mom because hospice wouldn't even come in because we had COVID. And I understood that, and I couldn't get any home health care. I could not get any help at all. And so I was sick trying to take care of my mom, 
and she was pretty much getting to be an invalid at that point, and then she got COVID. And so dealing with the healthcare system today uh, in this COVID world is, is just maddening. I was just about to lose my mind. I was getting false information. The hospice people were telling me one thing, and it was just very frustrating. I didn't, I've never seen such insanity. And so one morning I told Mike, I said, I've, I've got to get out of here and go for a walk. And I cried for an, I, I bawled my heart out for a mile. And on the way home, I just said, Lord, if I have to care for her till the day she dies, just give me supernatural strength because I can't do this with, you know, out your help. And I felt better. And I, two hours after I got home, I got a call from a hospice house that said they had a bed and they had 14 people on a list. And they came and got her and, uh, in an, an ambulance. And for three days, hospice, this hospice house took such good care of her. And she died three days later. 100 plus years 100 old. 100 years old. But it just gave me three days of reprieve to kind of get some rest and know she was being cared for. Um, God provided that for us because it was 14 people on our list. <laughs> And we only have two hospice houses where we live. So God just taught me a lot through that, that um, there's other people in those situations. And he particularly laid one lady on my heart to pray for every day. She has a special needs child, uh, severely handicapped. And I thought, you know, I have an end in sight with my mom. I know she's not going to live forever. But this lady has this child for the rest of her life to take care of. I prayed for her every day. And um, that's what we need to do. We need to pray for other people, and it takes your, the focus off of you. But I was able to talk to her, Sarah Kiefer, no. yeah, <laughs> and tell her that she had been my rock. I, my rock was praying for her. But just know, just know that God's aware of our circumstances. He knew what was going to you know, what was going to happen, and He was giving me strength every day, even though I was I felt like I was at the end of my rope every day. But he always got me through the day. <laughs> and he, will, he, again, will give you the strength you need. We're tougher than we think. Uh, and my mom, he had a plan for her. And she didn't have to go into a nursing home. She died very peacefully and, and, and in a beautiful, beautiful place. And they took such good care of her spiritually and emotionally. And I, I was just so blessed. And I just, I just take it. I, I, I love my mom. I'm so happy that she's in heaven because that's where she wanted to be. But it was just a very difficult time for, for me particularly and for you. And so if you've been through anything like that, I, I, you know how stressful it can be. <clears throat> and I just thank God that he took care of every detail. Well, I'll wrap this up. Her mother, just so you all know, it was about every 10 minutes needed to eat. And she would start screaming and at one o'clock in the morning or two o'clock in the morning or one thirty you'd hear a scream and her mother would want her. And she just couldn't keep living. So God's grace. What does that have to do with discipleship? Everything, because it's your life. If you're engaged in life, you're gonna have these encounters. And if you're not rooted on the rock, you will not make it. See, discipleship isn't just doing church stuff and Great Commission stuff in the mission field. It's how do you live as a husband and a wife and a mother and a father? How do you live as a person who's employed? I'll say this and we're done. The truths to take away from this study. Storms will come to all. If you're a disciple maker, expect them. Prepare for them. Be ready for them. Be anchored in Christ. Storms reveal your true foundation. They will expose what you've given your life to. Storms can be viewed as friend or foe, but they are never pleasant. I've never met a godly saint who said, oh, I'm just having so much fun. I'm suffering for Jesus. This is so enjoyable. If I heard that, I would recommend a good psychiatrist. It's never fun. Storms will either lead to repentance or anger, obedience or bitterness. The only hope for surviving the storm is to abide in Christ. And that's the heartbeat of discipling. Abiding in Christ begins before the storm clouds even gather. How's your quiet time? 
How is your time in hiding the word of God in your heart? How is your time in reflecting on the scriptures and thinking about what God said? When we are at our weakest, we discover God is all we need and his power is more than sufficient. His power truly is manifest in our weaknesses. Have you experienced that yet? You will. And lastly, trials of life can, if we permit them, lead to a deeper sense of God's presence and be used in the process of our purification and holiness. I want to be as pure as God wants me to be. That's pretty pure. He just chooses to use fire. Whenever trials come into your life, welcome them as friends, knowing that the trying or testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect so that you may be perfect, complete, lacking in nothing. James 1, 2 through 4. Let's pray. Father, thank you for being the Lord of the storm. And as we talk about discipleship, as we talk about disciple making, may we not just cruise over the realities of trials and storms that will be coming to each and every one. They'll come whether they love you or hate you, whether they serve you or reject you. But if they love you and they serve you and they give their life to the fulfillment of the Great Commission, you will carry them through. Because apart from you, we can do nothing. May we never forget that in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.